Hello and welcome. I am Nella Fahadayat and this is Doha Debates, a very special edition of Doha Debates brought to you from our virtual studio with our guests, our speakers, our virtual audience, connector and moderator all joining remotely from all over the world due to the coronavirus pandemic. I myself am here in my house in London. It's so good to have you. We have an astounding show coming up. Uh, this, our season finale of season one, I believe, our 10th episode. All of us are here to ask and try and find solutions to one very important question. The debate topic of this show is answer, asking the question, do we need new institutions for what feels like a new era? Do we need new institutions for what feels like a new era? This is all about global cooperation and what we need to do to ensure it in the future. Now, the debate topic is a very important one and the speakers that we have lined up are incredible. Leima Bowie is a Liberian peace activist and Nobel laureate. Echi Temel Koran is a Turkish author and political commentator and Yanis Varoufakis is a Greek economist and a politician. Hanging on to their every word will be our virtual studio audience who you should be able to see there behind me. I'm so thrilled to have you all there joining us remotely from all over the world. Wave if you hear your nation. We've got folks from South Africa, Rwanda, Palestine. Wave if you hear it. Lithuania, Poland, Portugal, Qatar, you are all welcome. Cambodia, Mali, Zimbabwe, Indonesia, Ethiopia, South Africa, South Korea even. I've run out of breath just saying that. I want to see a little wave from all of you just to know that you are real and you are there. Good to see you guys. We will also be joined by our wonderful connector, Dr. Govinda Clayton, who joins me now. Dr. Clayton, uh, this is a very big, difficult, broad subject. How are you going to be listening to see if we can find some consensus and clarity? I can't hear Govinda yet. But I'm oh, sure we'll figure now. that out. It's all hey live. Now, I did to, say so. Great to, great to see you. Um, yeah, I think this is exactly the right topic to be having, time to be having this debate. As uh, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Gutierrez, recently said, um, the international institutions are at a crossroads at the moment. And so the direction they go is really not clear. So I think this is exactly the time for us to be having this discussion. And, and my role is going to be to try and come in and st stitch the discussion together and find, start, find some points of consensus and common ground. Well, our virtual audience who are behind us there, Govinda, they will be vital because we will be voting at two points during the show to see what everyone makes of the wonderful solutions and the interesting insight that our three amazing speakers will bring. I think everyone is virtually ready to get online and have this out. I'm very excited to have you guys, our audience from around the world, joining us on all our social media platforms. Remember, I love hearing from you. Your comments, your questions, your thoughts. Is what you're hearing enraging you? Is it inspiring you? Let me know what you think. Use the hashtag Dear World. We are Doha Debates on every social media platform you can think of. So I think the set is ready. Our guests are ready. Our moderator, Khida Fakri, is ready. I'm going to hand over to her now for this Doha Debate. Dear World, we need to talk. Welcome to Doha Debates, where we are searching for solutions to global challenges. The pandemic has affected us all. No country is spared. When it comes to fighting a global pandemic, there is no place for me first. All of those countries were ripping off the United States for many years. International cooperation is at the crossroads. Is that a chance for the world to reboot? If you want to continue doing the same thing you did in the past, fine. I think they should do something different. I don't believe that a big bang reform is the way forward. Climate change, hunger, racial injustice and poverty. Our world is in crisis and in desperate need of leaders and institutions who can work together to address our global challenges. Leaders who can tackle pandemics, resolve conflict and break down barriers. Institutions that represent all nations, all peoples fairly. 
Our global institutions were challenged long before the COVID-19 crisis. Today, they are on the brink. But will this pandemic push them over the edge? Can global institutions built on the power structures of the last century guide us through the next era? Can they be reformed or should they be dismantled and replaced by institutions that befit our times and meet today's challenges? That is our debate. Please welcome your Doha Debates moderator, Hida Fakhri. Hello and welcome to our second virtual Doha debate. Over the past 75 years, the United Nations has played a central role in forging the noble ideal of multilateral cooperation, overcoming the Cold War and maintaining as much as it could world peace. But today, its role, its standing, its effectiveness, its very credibility are at stake, as is the case with the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, which were established three quarters of a century ago to organize international finance based on a gold standard system that has long disappeared and on the vision of its powerful members. But the world has evolved. New political forces, new technologies, new financial means have emerged. Do current global institutions need to be retooled to serve us for another 75 years or more? Or has the time indeed come to dismantle the existing architecture and build new institutions that reflect the balance of powers, the paradigms and the needs of the 21st century? A sign of the times, perhaps, today our audience will be online, including our voting panel made up of young people from around the world, and we count on everyone's spirited participation. And as always, we're live streaming on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter. And here to tell us more about how you can all join the conversation is our correspondent, Nedoufar Hedayat Nel. Thank you, Rida. Yes, we are always excited to hear from you. Our show is dependent on your perspectives. And Rida, I will be feeding a lot of the questions and the comments that our viewers who are watching send through. As ever, you can get in touch with us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on many of the social media platforms. We are at Doha Debates. Use the hashtag Dear World so we can easily find your comments and put them into the show. That's what I want to do. I want to get your comments and thoughts into our debate. Hida. Thanks very much, Nilofar. And before we get started with this timely debate, let's get a better sense of what we're actually talking about. Institutions like the United Nations have helped stabilize the world for decades, but they seem to be no match for today's problems. They're struggling to take meaningful worldwide action on climate change, racial injustice, and inequality. And now they're stumbling on a coordinated response to COVID-19. But there is hope. Multilateral organizations like the UN, NATO, the IMF, the World Bank were all born from a global catastrophe, the Second World War. So in the 1940s, world leaders came together to create political, economic and military systems that would maintain peace and a balance of power and, of course, rebuild war-torn Europe. It's just that now, these institutions are, well, pretty old and the world looks very different today. Plus, these institutions were created by and for the richest and most powerful nations in the late 1940s. Some of today's most outspoken activists are starting to hold that power to account and demand action. Can these global organizations change or is it time for them to retire? In parts of the West, a growing nationalist movement has brought a wave of authoritarian leaders to power. It's led the UK to separate from the European Union and the US to pull out of alliances like the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the Iran nuclear deal, which it had itself negotiated. And five non-Western countries that represent nearly half the world's population are leveraging their own economic power, known by the acronym BRICS. The countries have formed their own bank to rival the IMF and World Bank. Here's the thing. The UN and other multilateral organizations have always relied on the leadership and economic commitment of the largest world powers. These institutions are only as strong as their members. And it really comes down to their will and their sense of responsibility. From the hashtag MeToo movement to Fridays for Future to Black Lives Matter, activists across the globe are taking to the streets and demanding real change. Could these movements lead to new ways of organizing and wielding power? 
can they hold our stodgy global institutions to account or even maybe replace them? Too old and archaic, too set in their own ways? Is it a question of change or retire? The world has certainly changed over the last seven or eight decades. So what does the future of global governance look like? Can we fix our current international institutions to face our global challenges? Or do we need to simply rethink and rebuild them from the ground up? We'll be exploring this and much more with our guests, and they are Nobel laureate and peace activist Lema Bowie, author and political commentator Eche Temelkuran, and economist, academic and politician Yanis Varoufakis. It's great to have you all with us for this debate. We'll, of course, be joined a little later by our connector, Govinda Clayton. And it is always good to see you. Govinda will be with you shortly. But first, let's go straight to our guests. Our first speaker, Lema Bowie, is a woman's rights advocate and peace activist from Liberia. She won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 for her work leading a women's peace movement that helped to end the Second Liberian Civil War. Every time there is a problem in our world, every time we have a crisis, our first instinct is let's develop new institutions to replace the old ones. Almost 80 years ago, the UN the World Bank, the IMF, and other entities were started as a means of looking at some of the crises that the world was faced with. I must submit, we need to empower and reform our current global institution, equal representation of the global South. I refuse to accept that in this current dispensation of our world, that five countries should continue to deal with security have five permanent membership at the Security Council. When the UN was established, many of the countries were in colonial life. It's time for us to move away from that. It's time for us to reform with women empowerment, finding equal spaces for women to be in those positions. I believe any new institutions that come with the current world structure of power over will turn out to be the same. We saw 50 years ago, later after the UN, when the G20 started, it came as a means of mimicking the UN and other entities. What happened now, the G20 is finding it very difficult to do the things that it's set up to do. I believe any new institution that starts and starts with the same structure that we see in our world today will continue to do what it did. What we need right now is to have structures that calls together our collective humanity. The global crisis that we see happening in our world today has only amplified the loopholes. And today we need to address those by reforming the entities and making sure that we start looking at people centered around the values and the visions that those entities were established for in the first place. And the core of any reform should be our collective humanity, not one group after against the other. We should decide and determine that we'll work on racism, sexism, and all of those things that pit us together as a people. Until our world begins to think collectively, we will continue to have the problems that we have. No new institution will function and do any better than any of the current institution if people, the values of human life, the values of equality, the values of justice are not front and center. And these are the values that these current entities were formed on, and we should just go back and reform them. I submit. Our second speaker, Eche Temel Kuran, is a Turkish author and political commentator. Her forthcoming book, Together, 10 Choices for a Better Now, outlines a path to put faith in humanity first. International democratic institutions like the UN lost their moral ground and global uh, credibility at the start of the war in Iraq. Their last residue of prestige is wasted in Syria during the war. The power vacuum that is left by the failure of these institutions is now filled by global leaders 
with fascist inclinations who are making personal bargains over the destinies of their people. These leaders are toying with, the, with these institutions more easily and more dangerously than we could ever imagine. Right-wing populist leaders are rendering these institutions ineffective so that the consensuses of humanity are removed to create a vacuum in which these leaders can operate relentlessly as they desire. What is even worse is that these democratic institutions prove themselves to be completely incompetent when it comes to defending their principles. New political organizations will also arise from uh, the developing new political organisms that are taking place, that are emerging from the streets today. Uh, the protest movements around the world are reaching out and rising up. It began in Tahrir and now it's, it continues with Black Lives Matter. Masses who are considered to be indifferent to global affairs and politics are now uh, withdrawing their consent from uh, this current representative system. The scenes that have been emerging from these demonstrations are of those of a system that is a, at a breaking point. But there is no guarantee in which direction it will break. So our challenge today is to organize these spontaneous, spontaneous expressions of solidarity towards an enduring international movement. Democratic institutions like UN has to change. And this is only possible if we push them towards opening up to a more equal and true participation that stands upon grassroots politics. Our third speaker, Yanis Varoufakis, is an economist, academic, and politician. As Greek finance minister in 2015, he led the struggle against the European Union and global institutions. Every major challenge humanity faces, from climate change and unbearable inequality to unpayable debts and involuntary migration, are, glo are global problems in need of international solutions. And this is our conundrum. Never before have we needed global governance more at a time when many see the United Nations as dysfunctional, including good people working at the United Nations. Clearly, we and the governments claiming to represent us have a duty. We have a duty to reimagine new international institutions capable of addressing these multiple challenges. The only time humanity created global institutions that made a significant difference to people's everyday lives was after a global catastrophe in the 1940s. I hope and trust we do not need another catastrophe for us to unite against the oligarchy without frontiers, raiding and robbing today's youth of their future. What kind of new institutions do we need to tackle climate change and the crushing inequalities within our countries and also between the global north and the global south? Here are three examples. An international clearing union modelled on what John Maynard Keynes once proposed for ending the global imbalances feeding economic crisis. A new organization for emergency environmental cooperation backed by a successor to the International Monetary Fund to administer a Green Manhattan Project aiming, instead of mass murder, at preventing humanity's extinction. And thirdly, a new empowered United Nations Assembly, having effectively moved away from the Security Council, a new United Nations Assembly democratically to oversee the two aforementioned new institutions. In short, the world needs a new common plan and it needs new institutions to implement it. Nothing less can deliver humanity from unnecessary suffering and climate change. All our speakers we just heard from Yanis there and before him Eche and Lema. Thank you for all of your insights and perspectives. Let's quickly recap. Let's give our viewers a summary of the three positions we just heard. Lema Bowie says, we do not need new global institutions. Let's simply reform them. Eche Temelkuran 
says global institutions have lost moral ground. Let's unite and apply pressure from the outside. And finally, as you just heard, Yanis Varoufakis says we need new global institutions and let's not shy away from starting over. So you heard the arguments. We now want to hear from our voting panel. Our virtual audience that is watching this debate with us today will vote on these three statements. And here is how it works. It's time to vote. We need your input to find common ground among the speakers. We want to know exactly how much value you attach to the arguments you've heard. You have a total of 100 points to divide. You can divide them over one, two, or all three statements. To do so, simply assign points to the statements on a sliding scale. All right, and while our voting panel makes up its mind, you can join the debate by using the hashtag Dear World at Doha Debate. Send us your questions and comments and let us know what you think. Should we attempt to deconstruct the existing international order at the risk of ending up without any credible substitute? Should we simply tweak what we already have or should we turn the page and start with a blank slate? While you're sharing your thoughts, let's go to Nelufar and see what reactions we're seeing online. Nell, what are the trends that are emerging online? Thank you, Hida. Those are very interesting positions that have been set out and a lot for my virtual and online audience to consider. If we can have a look at our audience right now who are voting and casting their votes for the first time, that will be great. Now, we put uh, these two questions in a poll for our social media uh, uh, followers. And we asked two very distinct questions to see what their take was. And I'd love for our speakers to be able to comment on this. We asked, do you think that global institutions like the UN, World Bank, NATO and IMF, do you think that they can take on the challenges of today? 35% of you said yes, and 65% of you that voted on our social media platforms said no. We then asked another question. We asked, how do you think global institutions like the United Nations are handling the response to the coronavirus? 22% of you said well, 78% of you said poorly. And just to get into some of those comments from our uh, viewers who are watching online, who are commenting at Doha Debates, Ibrahimu tweeted today to say, the global institutions have failed, Rita. They failed to solve, solve any of the problems they were created to solve. However, the little things that they are doing is better than nothing. We can't afford to discard them without providing an alternative. So that is an interesting perspective. What is going to happen in that interim between one system and another? I wonder if we can get into that. Wayne in the US says global cooperation is a good thing and is already in place for many different issues. Still, sovereign nations will need to continue to govern themselves based on what is best for their own citizens. And this is interesting. Cooperation cannot turn into centralization. I really like that perspective. And then Madeleine in Italy says, I see the value in multilateral organizations and global cooperation and I've definitely met the very competent and knowledgeable folk who work in these institutions. So a mixed bag and I'm sure that my uh, online audience will be contributing much more as the debate goes on. Reda, back to you. Mixed bag, a bit of a conundrum as Yanis mentioned, certainly a catch-22 for many of the, the viewers weighing in. I believe we have the results of the vote. So do we need to keep our institutions and simply tweak them, reform them, or do we bury them all together and create new ones? So looking at the results of the votes there that you see on screen, there's a very a little distance, I think, between the first and last position in terms of how they've resonated with our audience. We don't need new global institutions. Let's reform them instead. That was Lema's argument, 36.8% of the vote. Yanis, we need new global institutions. Let's not shy away from starting over 39.6%. And a somewhat distant third position for Eche, who believes that global institutions have lost moral ground and it's all up to the grassroots movements to apply the pressure from outside. So these are the results as they stand, at least for now. Will they change once our speakers have elaborated on their positions? And once you've also had a chance to ask a few questions, please do keep those coming as we go into the next phase of our discussion. Welcome to the Mejlis, a traditional Arab consensus building practice. The focus of the Mejlis is to welcome critical conversations and reach solutions. Hida will encourage our speakers to bridge differences and find common ground. 
So let's see if we can find common ground. Let me go to you, Lema, first. You say we need to hold on to the existing institutions. We just need to reform them. But frankly, for the past 50 years, reform has been a buzzword in the UN system, including the Bretton Woods institutions. And at best, one might argue, reform has been cosmetic. Clearly, these organizations do not want to make any meaningful, substantive, structural reform. So hearing you say that we need reform, yet we need to hold on to these organizations almost sounds like someone wanting to make omelets, but not wanting to break the eggs. Uh, shouldn't we consider instead breaking up these institutions and shaping new ones, just as Yanis argues? No, I, I don't think so. I refuse to, 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 to agree with the point that we need new institutions. And let me just go back to Yanis's point. Even though he talked about new institutions emerging, but he still comes back to the same UN. He still comes back to the General Assembly being broken up. I mean, having some kind of position in his, the new institutions that should be established. In 1979, I believe, Muhammad Ali, when he gave his talk at the UN General Assembly, one of the things that he put forth was that there was a need to deconstruct all of the different things and start building the UN from the foundation, not to start a new UN. And I want to stand on that to say that when the UN was established, the principles and the values of which the UN was established was firmly grounded in people, people. Over time, member states that have gotten so powerful has taken on their own politics, different roles, and the UN has become so bureaucratic. And I feel that the value of the UN still stands. We should still go into it. We should still work with it. Because if we move outside and inside, and I think HS point of the civil society being involved, applying pressure, can be accommodated, but establishing new institutions, because the UN was established for people. And who are the people? The vast majority of the population outside civil society, they should have a voice in the governing structure of the UN. So I buy into her idea a bit, but to break it down, I refuse to accept that because as long as we continue to focus on the politics, the policy, the resources, the money, militarism, and take humanity out of whatever we're doing, any new institution that is started on those grounds that the world continues to operate from will fail just as we're saying the UN is failing. So reform is not refusing to break the egg. It's opening up that egg and taking the yolk and using it for what it's supposed to be used for and taking the white and using it for what it's supposed to be used for. Be careful when you use food analogy for me. All right. So there you have it, Yanis. We can make a perfectly good uh, omelette without breaking the eggs, uh, uh, Lema believes. I mean, I know that you're a rebel, a rebel with a, with a cause, you might argue. You have taken on the powerful, the IMF, powerful institutions. But let's face it, in the end, aren't institutions as good as the people who lead them? Even if you establish new organizations, as Lema suggests, won't you run into the same old problem? of having people at the top who lead them who will promote the same failed policies. Let's face it, that's possibly why you will never be head of the European Commission. Isn't the problem less about a systemic problem than it is about the kinds of people who lead the organizations and who may or may not be ready to take risks and frankly do the right thing? An error. I'm not more of a rebel than Lema is or Edge. Um, these are wonderful women that um, um, have been truly radical in the way they have transformed their countries, their communities, public opinion. And, and allow me to say that um, I really cannot see any difference of substance between our three positions. I agree entirely, Dema, that uh, the whole point is not to go back to ground zero and rebuild from zero. Huh? This is not, we're not Pol Pot, right? Uh, what we want is to reform those institutions and create new ones to support the reformed existing ones. So, of course, I rely on the United Nations. I want to see the end of the Security Council, and I want to see an empowered and democratic United Nations Assembly. Uh, Edge is absolutely spot on when she says that the international institutions, the ones we're discussing, lost all credibility with the Iraq war and not just with the Iraq war, and that we need grassroots pressure in order to have the reform and rebuild 
that we are discussing. So I know that these debates become more fun when people vote between different positions, but the, the, the good news is that our three positions are effectively one. And I do refuse to be part of this, you know, fake uh, contest between us. To answer your question directly, no, I don't think that institutions are as good as the people who lead them. Institutions can be systemically evil. They can be structured in such a way that they turn good people that staff them into impotent persons. You know, when I was from struggling against the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, the European Commission, I was not struggling against bad people. I was, you know, most of them were decent people trying to do their best within institutions whose uh, structure, however, was such that it was, they were meant to, to serve the interests of an oligarchy. Uh, so we need to restructure institutions so as to restructure the persons, and we need to restructure the persons in order to restructure the institutions. All right. Ecce, what do you think? Is it an issue of restructuring, restructuring the, the, the leaders, the, the people, or the governance systems themselves? To what extent does grassroots movements um, actually affect change on an international level. They may at the regional, local level, certainly at the national level, but the constituents of these global institutions aren't people. They're states and governments. How do you affect change there? Well, this is going to be a very easy, comfortable majlis because we all agree at the very bottom of the you know, topic. Uh, we are all three of us are people who believe that people should be living a more dignified life. Uh, the, you know, the world should be more just and so on and so forth. So Yanis was right. We are not in competition here. And what we have brought up, three of us, actually... Uh, complete each other. So it's going to be a very fun majlis, uh, so to speak. Uh, my, uh, first of all, I didn't say civil society. I have a problem with that uh, con uh, concept. I said grassroots, mo grassroots movement. And I mentioned political organisms that are still developing uh, on the streets all over the globe uh, during these demonstrations. Uh, what I see when I look at the world, since, especially since Tahrir, um, is that people, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the protest movements, the resistance, uh, is organizing in the same manner. And each time they are developing themselves uh, towards, a, towards a, you know, concrete organization. We are not there yet, but we are getting there. And this, um, this manner of organizing, this manner of spontaneous solidarity, I think is a very important um, inspiration for the, uh, for the organizations that we want to have. Uh, and I, I feel like UN and such democratic institutions are like sinking ships. They have already sunk, maybe. And what we have to do actually, like in Occupy moments, occupy these sunken ships in order to turn them into new organisms, in order to transform them into reefs full of new life. We cannot get rid of UN. We cannot get rid of, uh, you know, the institutions that the humankind achieved so far. But what we can do is to uh, spot the problem that, um, that corrupts these institutions and then get rid of that problem. And that problem in, at the very heart of it is that the, we are living in a contradictory uh, crossroads, so to speak. The main contract of capitalism and the main uh, fundamental contract of democracy are contradictory to each other. Democracy says that we are equal and we are going to be represented equal, whereas capitalism said, say, well, we are not that equal. So what happened after the 1980s in the world, all over the world, and to all institutions, is that the world um, chose the contract of capitalism over the contract of democracy. That is why, including UN, all the in international institutions have been corrupting uh, gradually. Uh, it is not the people, it's not the institution itself, but what the system of the world is diminishing democracy to a theatrical act. Representative democracy sure. is today 
is not really understood as a, as a system where people are feeling represented. That's why they are going on streets to show that so, they so let are me, let present me jump in. and they are not agreeing. Okay. So, so Etche, you put your finger on it, uh, even though you did call the UN a democratic institution. Institution, many would argue that it, it is far from that. The theatrics of the General Assembly, where you've got every state represented, 193 of them, really pales in comparison to the real power that's concentrated in the hands of the five permanent members of the Security Council, as we know. But let me take this point to, to Lema. Lema, who wants to who still believes in the UN, has faith in it, wants to somehow push the United Nations to reform itself, to, to gain equal representation. Let me say, Lema, as you well know, uh, Africa, your continent, has been shortchanged for, for decades. Granted, the UN has played a critical role in the whole decolonization process of the 60s and 70s, but economically, Africa is still lagging behind, and you've got all these major powers still pulling the strings. I mean, we know about the, the blood diamonds in, in the context of the Liberian War, but look at the DRC. Uh, the war there has been raging uh, for, for, for decades now, awesome. still goes on, and you've got these, these uh, countries uh, competing economic interests, keeping, keeping the conflict alive. Well, let me go back to, to, to my point. I don't think it is necessarily the institutions that have caused all of these problems, and I agree with everyone. I think it is really our failure as people to, 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 to see humanity from the perspective of, to see the world from the perspective of humans or from the perspective of people and being able to really look in depth um, Acha talks about the, the, the protests and all of the different movements. And I think these are very good pressure that people are putting out on governments and institutions. I wouldn't probably be out here if I wasn't part of a popular movement, grassroots movement to end the Liberian Civil War. But one of the things that we're seeing over time is how these protests are now turning into the same monster of institutions where People protest, women protest, and then when the governments are toppled, you don't see women anymore. And that same structure of, of, of leaving one group of people behind and running with another group of people comes into perspective. I think if our world, and I, I can't continue to say this even harder, can look at humanity from the way the world is supposed to operate, if our leaders, especially in Africa, were really concerned about the people and not their huge Swiss bank account in many instances and whining and dining with Western leaders and selling the resources of their continent, I think we would be at a better place. The UN is as strong as its member state. If we have member states that are corrupt, if we have powerful nations that have no interest in other nations, regardless of which kind of entity we bring to bear again, we will still find ourselves at the same place. You cannot have a world where leaders are self-seeking and calling other nations as whole nations and all kinds of different things and expect that. How do you change the world if you establish a new system without, say, powerful countries like the U.S., France, Britain, all of these different things, they will still infiltrate these institutions and it will all be about their position, their interests, resources, and all of but, the different things. Humanity right. at so, the core of all of this. So, so you mentioned collective humanity, and I want to put this point quickly to Yanis before bringing in our connector, who's, as Eche says, whose job is already uh, pretty much done. But, but Yanis, to this point of putting collective humanity at the center of, of things at a time of a global crisis, a pandemic that has already affected 30 million people around the world and, and counting. Oxfam sounded the alarm bell by saying that a small group of rich nations that represents barely 13 percent of the global population has already bought up and reserved more than 50 percent of the vaccine supply. And yet you do not hear a word of criticism from the president of the World Bank or the secretary general of the United Nations unwilling to call a spade a spade. So back to the point that we made earlier, isn't it really also about individual political leadership, leaders who are willing to call things as they see them and to stand up to the powerful and the rich. 
Very much so. Uh, you do need people to take personal responsibility for what happens and call a spade and spade, even if it means losing their job, because those who appointed them didn't put them there to speak for humanity. They put them there to speak for them, for the vested interests. But look, speaking again about institutions, uh, look at the pandemic. You know, the need for a proper public health system around the world, in the United States as well. Look at climate change. Uh, it is my estimation that we need at least $10 trillion, $10 trillion to be spent every year on uh, climate change, mitigating climate change, and public health globally. Uh, that's not a huge amount of money if you think that about 100 and 110 billion, trillion is the to total income. Now, we need to talk about how this is going to happen. The United Nations does not, does not have the means to do this. Uh, if, even if Mr. Guterres made a wonderful speech, he just doesn't have the means. It's the IMF and the World Bank that were created uh, in Bretton Woods in order to play that role. But since the end of Bretton Woods in 1971, these became institutions acting on behalf of the large financiers of the West as bailiffs for calling in the loans of the third world, Africa in particular, if you remember the special adjustment programs in the 1970s. So this is why we need a combination of personal responsibility and new institutions with the capacity to shift resources from the idle rich financial institutions that are swimming in huge quantities of money that are doing nothing productive, even in the West, shift these resources to public health, mitigating climate change, creating good quality jobs, public education. All right, not a huge amount of disagreement between the three of you, but still worth bringing in our connector. Dr. Govinda Clayton is a senior researcher in peace processes within the Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich. Dr. Clayton's research interests include negotiation, mediation, conflict management, and civil war. As our connector, Dr. Clayton will provide guidance on identifying common ground and steering towards bridge building and consensus. Govinda, you've had tough ones before. This one looks like a walk in the park, doesn't it? And thanks a lot, Gita, and thanks to all the speakers. I've uh, really enjoyed the discussion so far. Um, but I think most of the consensus that we've heard up to this point has been really focused on the, the broad understanding that things have to change. So nobody is suggesting that the system that we have now is, is functioning in the way in which we'd like it to and that the status quo is, is, is acceptable in any ways. But equally, we've seen the consensus around the around the fact that we shouldn't be ripping up the existing international order and we have to look for different ways in which we can build around that. But what I'd really like to see as we move deeper into the majlis is a bit more focus and potentially points of consensus around what the new or the next iteration of international order might look like. And so here I'd love to hear the speakers more clearly articulating what is their vision or their goals in terms of the future of international order. In particular, for some of the younger viewers that are watching today, it would be great to hear, like, what's their vision that might inspire other people to support the kinds of reforms that you're talking about? I think this other type of consensus could be really powerful for everyone watching at home. Thank you. All right, Govinda, thank you, as always, for these words of wisdom. Let's, uh, let's head straight then to, to Lema. Uh, Lema, you know, in terms of inspiring the younger generation, as, as a Nobel Peace laureate yourself, as an organizer of a women's peace movement in Liberia that's been credited with ending the civil war there, when you say these organizations should be reformed, I mean, would the best reform and possibly even the only needed reform be that women lead these organizations? Well, that would be my first take. Um, we you remember when... Um, Ban Ki-moon was leaving the UN, we had put on such as um, CSO and grassroots organization, there was such a movement for bringing in the first female secretary general at the UN. Unfortunately for us, we didn't get that. So I would think that in this moment, when we're looking for reform, beyond having a woman as the head of the UN, the UN has a lot of policies around gender equality and all of the different things. My key interest most times, or primarily, is the peace and security processes. We still have yet to see women leading peace mediations in different parts of the world. A lot of the mediation processes are primarily male-dominated, and we already know from statistics that negotiations and mediations that have a lot of women input tend to last longer than the ones with all men. 
the UN had a Security Council Resolution 1325 calling for the participation of women, the protection of women in conflict situation and conflict context. I still, we still have yet to see the UN um, prioritizing. So as part of that reform, 1325 should be front and center of every peace process, every peace negotiation, every peacekeeping mission. It should be not just in words, but in action followed by the resources. One of the key reforms that I think needs to happen in the UN is the Security Council. Gone are the days where Africa had countries that were in colonial rule. So the US could say we have, Britain could say we have countries under our rule. It's over now. Africa is proving that we can do, we are doing better, regardless of some of the areas where we have our leaders who don't know where they want to take their individual countries. But I think it's time for us to shift the way the Security Council is, is conducted. There should not be five permanent members. It's time for us to have a membership kind of thing that is rotational. No US, no Russia, no China, no, no five permanent members. Every nation All is right. equal under God. One nation, one vote, in other, in other words. Yanis, very quickly, before we get to a, uh, a member of the audience who's ready to ask a question, I wonder what you uh, say to the idea of women being better peace builders and, and uh, making uh, better negotiators at the end of the day and, and having more women lead these organizations and to the point of whether or not these institutions uh, and regional groupings are democratic enough. I know that you have launched a progressive pan-European party to democratize the EU before it disintegrates. But quite frankly, looking at the UN, the EU seems pretty democratic in the fact that you you don't have any state with a, with a veto. They're all equal, of course, with a caveat that some are more equal than others. Your thoughts? Well, the world would be a far better place if women were in, in, in government rather than us uh, members of the defective sex. There's no doubt about that. Uh, having said that, um, I don't think it's just a question. It, it's not as easy as that or as simple as that. Um, I negotiated with um, uh, the head of the International Monetary Fund, who was um, a very pleasant, very clever, very smart woman, Christine Lagarde. The Chancellor of Germany at the time was um, an, another you know, stupendous woman, Angela Merkel. And yet those institutions and those governments continued to impose, not so much because of the predilection of those women or the people in power, but because of their systemic tendencies to impose uh, misanthropic policies on our, on, on our people. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that our pan-European movement here in Greece, in the Greek parliament, uh, we have more women members of parliament than, than men. Uh, but it is important to ask the question, OK, let's say we replace all the men with women. How do, we, how do those women deal with the fact that they don't have the levers, the levers by which to control finance? You know, there's 750 trillion, trillion, 750 trillion dollars worth of derivatives and, you know, fictitious capital doing the rounds in the world markets. A tiny amount of that would be fantastic if it was diverted towards, you know, creating good quality jobs, public education, public health, mitigating climate change. And yet the levers are not there for doing it. None of our institutions can do that. The IMF doesn't have that. The IMF does exactly the opposite. It takes from the poor and gives to the rich. So for women in power or in government to be able to be in power in order to empower the things that humanity needs, we need the new institutions and the systemic change that I've been speaking about. Okay. All right. Thank you, Yanis. Let's go to one of our audience members, a student, I believe, who's ready to ask a question. Please introduce yourself and go ahead. Yeah, my name is Augustine. I'm calling from the from the U.S. My question goes to uh, Lima. Uh, I would also like uh, Yanis to, to weigh in. Uh, one could argue that the dysfunctionality of the League of Nations uh, paved way for the First World War. Uh, how could we ensure that the deterioration of the U.N. Uh, doesn't pave way for uh, the same outcome given the current happenings? All right, Lima, to you first, briefly. World, technically is already at war. I I'm sorry to say, I mean, the virus has taken us in a way that we've never seen before. But 
right now where we find ourselves, the question is, how long is it going to take us really and truly to realize that it's not just the institutions that will establish peace in the world as we want to see it. It is all of the nations of the world. And if these nations of the world are hell-bent on doing things the way they've always done it before, we find ourselves in the same situation over and over. Recently, we, in a conversation with a group of people, we had this same argument about the UN. And the UN is as strong as its member states. And if the member states decide that they are going to conduct business the way it is being done, our world will continue to find itself in the way, in the place that it finds itself. So I don't think necessarily the UN as it is, as it's functioning, we're all saying that there's a serious problem, is going to lead to any more problem than we're already seeing in our world. What we need to do now is to determine how we want to move forward on this. I don't know if I answered right. your question. Well, Yanis, uh, I know that um, um, Augustine wanted you to weigh in as well. So we've been talking about the slow death of the UN for a long time and where it might lead. Briefly, what, what are your thoughts? Well, think about it. In 1999, the West bombed Yugoslavia, a European country. They didn't even ask the United Nations for permission to do this. Then you had the, the Gulf War, the second Gulf War that Edger referred to. Again, the United Nations were sidelined. Uh, so I very much fear that, yes, exactly like the League of Nations, the United Nations has become toothless, and the great powers will do whatever they think they, is in their interests. So, to answer your question directly, it is we Europeans that have um, a moral duty to stop European nations from conducting war like they are in Libya today. It is for American progressives to bind together to stop American government from persecuting war. It is for the Chinese citizens, for the Russian citizens, the citizens and residents of the countries with the power to wage war. We must act in order to prevent that and in order to re-empower the United Nations and to create the new institutions that need to go along with the United Nations in order to create global peace and shared prosperity across the world. All right, let's go for another question from the audience. I believe we have another student standing by. Go ahead with your question. Hello, I'm Natasha and I'm tuning in from Doha. My question is for Yanis. How do we solve a problem like climate change given that our social, economic and political systems seemed designed to resist it. You mentioned it briefly, but could you go more in detail about what those alternative systems could look like? Thank you. Yanis, uh, to you as a politician and an economist, the nexus between big corporation, fossil fuel industries and, and governments, what does the future look like there? Well, the large corporations already know what needs to be done. Even British Petroleum has just recently announced that it's moving away from fossil fuels. Uh, the question is, who determines the, the pace of change and the direction of change and the distribution of the green technologies and the, of the good quality jobs that will crea crea come from that? We, are going to, we know we're going to rely on hydrogen. We know that we will rely, rely on renewables. We need to very quickly move away from extraction from, of fossil fuels. Uh, the possibility there for massive public investment that will crowd in private investment, even entrepreneurial companies that want to be part of this new green revolution. It's all there, but somebody needs to fund it and somebody needs to coordinate all this. This is why I suggested during my introductory speech a new organization for emergency environmental cooperation to be backed by a successor to the International Monetary Fund. This is not the time to, to be technical about it, but it is perfectly possible, even without taxing the West, to create public financial instruments that shift a huge amount of wealth from the global north to the global south in a manner which funds the green transition that the planet needs, while at the same time creating the good quality jobs from which poor people are going to be elevated from poverty. All right, and we have a question here uh, from our online audience, Brandon in the United States. This is a question for Eche. How do we organize all of these grassroots groups, Eche? At the end of the day, one might argue it is only indigenous forces that can bring about peace and social and economic development. How do you organize these movements? They are already linked to each other. They know about each other. They even make the same jokes uh, from, you know, Egypt to Minneapolis. 
So they are linked, they are connected to each other uh, through social media and so on. Uh, what I propose is the international alliance of these movements. Uh, from Black Lives Matter to Hong Kong, from Egypt, from Beirut to, I don't know, Iceland. Coffee. So we need this, not only because to, to save the UN or anything, but we need this for the future of the humanity because uh, young people are watching us today, mostly young people. And I know that, I know that this generation, the new generation, as far as I can see, uh, is quite cynicist and nihilist, and I totally understand that because they found a you know crumbling planet on their lap, and they don't trust in institutions. I mean, I wonder how many people know the you know head, uh, name of the head of UN today without googling it. When we were growing up, we knew it because UN then mattered, but now it does not really matter, and everybody actually. Uh, pretty much knows that UN does not uh, do anything. He, they just sit there like a paralyzed giant when you know bombs are flying over. So what we need is to assemble these uh, movements all around the globe to uh, and to make them occupy these places where big decisions are made, like UN, like IMF, or like World Bank. And uh, not only from outside, maybe, maybe infil uh, through infiltrating to these institutions and changing them. And we have to find, we have to redefine power in a way that does, it doesn't uh, corrupt so easily, as easily as it is today, as Lehman said. And what is happening today on the streets, I think, is people are looking for that kind of power how to come together, how to organize, so that uh, the institutions uh, that they are going to create would not corrupt as easily as today's institutions. Interesting, Eche, you bring up the issue of the credibility gap uh, of the UN. Many would argue it hasn't just started in the last few years, but in fact dates back to uh, two or three uh, decades ago. And the fact that the Security Council at the end of the day doesn't have uh, authority really over its member states if they do decide to violate any resolution and go to war or anything of, of the sort. But let's head to our audience one more time and with a final a question from one of our audience members who's ready to to ask the question there you go go ahead please hi i'm fiona coming from seoul south korea and my question goes out to all the speakers so despite how all the speakers stress the importance of global governance and reform during this time critics of globalization would argue that the pandemic is actually the perfect opportunity for states to remove themselves from global institutions altogether and focus more on domestic policies and affairs. What's your take on this perspective? Who is this question for, Fiona? Um, it's open to all Anyone. the speakers. Right. Any yeah. takers? Uh, Lema, perhaps to you. Well, I, I, I first just want to rush back to um, something you said about the UN being an institution failing for some time. I want to ask a hypothetical question to anyone. 20, 30 years ago, when the UN was still functional in the eyes of the world, what was that thing that made it a functional, um, functional institution? The answer would be that we had leaders around the globe who were interested in humanity, who were interested in peace and security, who was interested in the global community and how interrelated they were. Today, we find ourselves in a world where we have leaders who are only interested in as powerful as they can get. And to answer your question, Fiona, I, don't, I think what the virus has done for all of us is to see our nations become individual in their way of thinking. Every country went on lockdown. Every country went on shutting down their borders. Every country went on, it's all about me and my people or me and my politics. And what are we seeing? That there are still calls now for them to come back to the global world. So I don't think removing themselves from globalization and focusing on their individual countries is going to do any of us any good. We say we all live in a global village. One sneeze in Africa can impact someone in Europe or Asia. So I don't want to believe that removing themselves is going to make our world any better than it is right now. 
So before we head to a second round of voting, thank you, Fiona, for that question. Yanis, let me ask you briefly about uh, uh, the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, sure, many people, if not everyone, would agree that they are indeed anachronistic, certainly after the main tenet uh, of the system was dropped. But still, the primacy of the U.S. dollar, as we see it, as the principal uh, currency of international trade and finance, is it up to other nations, China, Russia, and the other emerging powers to challenge uh, this. I, I, the fundamental problem, is it the fact, as you see it, that the world has embraced this neoliberal uh, economic system with, with, with its various flavors? Is this part of the problem that we face today? Well, China can do nothing about the, the exorbitant privilege of the dollar because China relies to a very large extent on that privilege. Remember that the, the Chinese government has entrusted a huge savings of the Chinese people in American debt, in, Amer in the American dollar. So, uh, the, you know, there is a symbiosis between the Chinese economy and the American economy, American capitalism and Chinese capitalism, uh, despite the clash that you can see evolve, especially coming from the United States side. Uh, so, no, I don't believe that, that, that any particular country, Russia, China or Europe, can do anything about the exorbitant privilege of the dollar. Uh, what we need to do, and I'm coming to the second part of your question, is especially those of us progressives in the United States, in Europe, we have to work towards uh, a reframing the international institutions, which in the end are not even conducive to the interests of the majority of the Americans, the majority of the Europeans. It is the minority of Americans and the minority of Europeans, and some minority perhaps in China, even in Russia, who benefit from the exorbitant power of the, of the, of the dollar. So, you know, this is not a clash between America and China. It is not a clash between Russia and America. Here is a clash between a, an oligarchy without frontiers, which benefits from the current system at the expense of the world community. And if I can add a quick answer to Fiona, uh, who asked a pertinent question and a great question. I fear that COVID-19 has massively boosted nationalism and has allowed those who benefit from the present world order against the interests of the many to bolster their position at the expense of humanity, uh, in, but in a manner that serves their private interests. All right, thank you, Yanis. Uh, we'll get your thoughts as well on this, uh, Etche. But let's uh, do a second round of voting now and see if our discussion has changed the minds of our voting panel in any way. Before we do so, though, let me quickly remind everyone of the three positions we heard earlier today. Lema Bowie says we do not need new global institutions. Let's simply reform them. Etche believes that global institutions have lost moral ground. Let's unite and apply pressure from the outside. And Yanis says we need new global institutions. Let's not shy away from starting over. So after listening to our guests, has our voting panel's thinking shifted yet again? You can all join this debate by using the hashtag Dear World at Doha Debates. Let us know what you think. And let's go back to, to Nelufar once again to see what's going on out there in cyberspace. Nelufar. Thank you, Rida. Yes, people are very much uh, enjoying and, and celebrating, but also taking to task a lot of what our speakers are saying and their very passionate uh, positions. Um, I want to thank our viewers in Berlin, Florida, Islamabad, Pakistan, Argentina, Ireland, New York, Malawi, Philippines, Bangladesh, Somalia, and so many more places from joining on all our many platforms. Now, you asked me what everyone online is saying, and I'll, and I'll tell you. Um, in Oakland, California, Emma says, I am personally interested in alternate ways of mutual aid and support in grassroots communities. We can't expect the UN or the World Bank to solve everything without any cooperation. Uh, a lot of what Eche was saying kind of being drawn on there. Uh, someone else has commented to say it's time for a new dawn. Out with global corruption, corrupt institutions, global cooperation is not found in VIP places where racism is perpetuated and all and old boys club systems exist to divide. So this idea of people being torn between wanting to fix the institutions that we have, but to burn things and start anew uh, is very much still a debate that's being had online, Rida. And a debate that we can uh, go on with for another hour or two, but uh, time is indeed running out. And I do know that we have the second round of voting, the results there. We can actually put them up and compare them to, to the original results. 
at the end of at the beginning of this debate. So what we had originally was this: uh, Yanis's position was the one that garnered almost 40 percent of the vote, and then Lema's almost 37 percent, and Eche 23 percent. With the fact that global institutions have lost moral ground, everyone sort of agrees on this. She believes it is up to uh, pressure from the outside to make a difference. Now the current vote reveals somewhat of a different dynamic. Uh, Lema's perspective has moved up in terms of uh, the resonance it's, ha it's had with our audience, our voting panel. We do not need new global institutions. Let's simply reform them. Over 40 percent of the vote there. Uh, Yanis, on the other hand, let's not shy away. Let's simply you know, break down and rebuild the institutions has gone from 39 percent of the vote to 29 percent. And uh, Eche's perspective has also moved up there in the ranking. So this is where we're at. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Let me ask each of you about concrete steps you would suggest our young audience uh, take up and what you make of these results. So to you first, Lema, are you surprised first off by the results? What do they tell you about what young people want, what they need, and what would you advise the upcoming generations? What concrete steps would you say they should take? I think one of the, the reasons why we see our world in the crisis that we find ourselves is that a lot of our political institutions today are at a place where our young people are voting towards celebrity, the celebrity culture. Um, I think it's time for our young people as they're interested in social media and all of the different things to really get interested in the political life of their different nations. Study those who are going to parliament, study those who want to be president and different things in their countries to ensure that as they take on this leadership, it will not be people who will just be interested in their nations. While sovereignty is important, but interconnectedness is also important. Court or key to all of that is someone or individuals who have the heart of our collective humanity. The South Africans will say Ubuntu. In my own native language, it's a kuka tono, meaning we are all one. And there is no way that we can do a world, do a new world order in the way that we're doing it now without putting people at the center and the heart of it. And young people need to really understand that they are the next generation. Taking on the power of our life, of our world, means that we're interested in people. If you're interested in people, you're interested in peace. If you're interested in people, you are interested in climate change. If you're interested in people, you're interested in education, justice, and health care. Thank you very much, Lema. Uh, to you, Eche, what do you say to the millions of people who are out on the streets protesting for climate action, for racial justice, uh, those young people who are disillusioned and want to take things into their own hands? What is your advice to them? Uh, to those who feel that they cannot influence what is happening on a global level? What steps can they take to make their voices heard? First, uh, here's to them. Uh, I am proud of them because they are already aware that we are on our own. Our democracies are hijacked by right-wing populists and they are working together, although they seem like fighting with each other uh, because of nationalistic, you know, they are stirring this nationalistic uh, feelings and so on. We are on our own uh, and we have to, uh, we can build a better world right now, we starting right now. But what we need is uh, to refresh our faith in humankind and in ourselves because we lost it. And, you know, our hope and our faith in humankind have been corrupted by, you know, by everything that happened in the last decade. So our, my advice or I would tell all these people, especially the young people, uh, that we can do this together. What we need is to go around this sunken ship and uh, occupy it to transform it into a living, alive reef once again. Thank you, Eche. Yanis, what would you tell your students today? What would you tell students around the world who are yearning for change for social justice? Like Eche, I will also congratulate uh, youngsters around the world for their Fridays for Future, for their um, you know stri climate st strikes, for protesting you know the Black Lives Matter. Um, but we need to go beyond protest because we've seen many waves of protests over the last thirty years or so. The era of neoliberalism or financialization as 
my economist mind thinks of it, uh, we've seen those waves come and go and fizzle out. You've got to be able to answer. You know, the stronger you are as a movement, the more pertinent the question becomes when a journalist like your good self you know, puts a microphone into, your, into their face and says, OK, so what do you want? You know, what should we do? You, we know what you don't want. How are we going to mobilize $10 trillion uh, for the purposes that you want, like climate change, good quality jobs, social justice, and so on? You've got to have an answer. And this answer includes institutions. So there's no doubt that we have to use the existing institutions and reform them hmm, in order to answer this question. We need some new institutions because we have new circumstances and new challenges that cannot be dealt with by the old ones. But we need a common plan. You see, the bankers around the world and the right-wing populists, the xenophobes, have a common plan. They have a common narrative. Whether you ask a banker in Chile or a banker in Switzerland uh, for their opinion, they will give you the same Davos story, if you know what I mean. If you ask a nationalist, a xenophobe, a racist, whether it's Trump or Le Pen or Salvini or Orban, they will give you the same answer, the same answer, right? Now, progressives around the world need to have the same answer too, a common program and a common action plan, including the question of or an answer to the question about new institutions. A common plan and common belief in a better future. A thank you to all our guests, Lema, Bowie, Ecete Melkuran and Yanis Varoufakis for this discussion, which may have seemed somewhat academic considering that we are in the midst of the worst pandemic in a century and that we do face an acute climate crisis which requires urgent and bold leadership. Our future, as you all say, certainly depends on it at the grassroots, at the national and at the global levels. Thank you to the Doha Debates team, our correspondent, Nelu Far, and our connector, Govinda, and everyone who joins us on, joined us online today. And thank you to the Qatar Foundation for bringing us all together. Let's continue the conversation online on Instagram, YouTube and Twitter using the hashtag Dear World at Doha Debates. We hope you'll join us for our next debate. But until then, from me, Rida Fahri, and the entire Doha Debates team, thanks for being with us.